Good morning and welcome to SIO's educational web webinar series. Today's topic is Global Perspectives on Online Integrative Oncology Care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our presenters today are Drs. Erin Benair and Drs. Linda Balneves. Erin Benair is the Director of Integrative Oncology Program, Haifa and Western Galilee Oncology Service, Lynn, Carmel, and Zebulon Medical Centers, Clalit Health Services, Associate Professor, Rappaport Faculty of Medicine, Technion Israel Institute of Technology, and co-chair of the SIO Online Task Force. Dr. Linda Balneves is Associate Professor, the College of Nursing, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Manitoba, Deputy Director, Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, and past President, Society for Integrative Oncology. And I welcome you to the program. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Linda, as was mentioned, and I'll be starting us off this morning. Um, we do hope that today we don't have a huge number of people joining us that we'll be able to have some interaction uh, regarding the guidelines that we are currently working on and getting your own feedback on your experiences in offering online integrative oncology care uh, during the COVID pandemic and going forward. Um, to start today, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction um, to our task force and what our goals and aims have been. Uh, Aaron is then going to give some clinical exemplars, uh, sharing some of his own personal experiences, clinical experiences in offering online uh, integrative oncology care, and just kind of showing the potential of what is possible and what are some innovative models of care uh, in our field. We're then going to spend about half an hour really diving into the recommendations and we hope that's really where we can have some interaction. Uh, we'll be pausing after each recommendation to get any dialogue or discussion or comments that you may have. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have uh, an open discussion session regarding maybe some of the recommendations that uh, you thought we should have that are missing, things that you think could be revised, uh, and just discussing where we're going as a field in terms of offering care online. Um, to start, let me just turn on our slides. Oh, and just some quick housekeeping. We're going to have everyone muted. If you'd like to um, say something, uh, we don't have a raise your hand function, um, but you're, you're free to kind of uh, put a hand up in the chat session, letting us know that you'd like to make a comment. If you have a question um, that you just don't want to forget about, please just write it in the chat and we'll return to it. Um, but we're going to keep everyone on mute uh, while we're presenting just to limit uh, the noise. So hopefully you can all see my slides right now. Um, and I just wanted to kind of introduce you to the task force. Um, the task force really arose uh, very rapidly in March as um, the COVID-19 pandemic began to spread uh, internationally. Uh, and a group of us with SIO really recognized that many organizations and institutions were really um, either having to close down their services or trying to be creative and innovative in moving a lot of their services online. Uh, and as we were talking as a group, you know, the question kind of arose, what are the challenges and the issues and the strategies that would allow us to really offer, you know, valid, reliable and safe online care? And our task force arose. So Aaron and myself are acting as the co-chairs um, of this task force, but we also have members. Um, we have uh, Gunmer Canel, who's coming from Germany. We have Ana Maria Lopez from the US, uh, Channing Poller, uh, Eva Pendleton, and Shelley White. They can um, form uh, the core of our online task force. And then in terms of the overall goal of the task force, which is really about trying to create, um, you know, creative initiatives that will provide integrative oncology practitioners with evidence-based guidance and practical skills in offering integrative oncology-based therapies to patients, 
caregivers, as well as oncology staff uh, through the internet and in the safety of their homes. And I know from my experience here in Canada, um, we're seeing not only in integrative oncology, but also in conventional oncology care, a lot of our services are moving towards online platforms. Uh, and it's really forcing us as clinicians uh, to be very innovative in the care we provide, but also having to consider what are some of the risks of online care and how can we do it well. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to, I just need to end my slides, uh, over to Aaron, who's going to show some practical examples of some of the online services that they're offering in their center. Aaron. Hi, everybody. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you are. And uh, I will just uh, share the screen so we can look together. And... Uh, Okay, so, so a little bit of, of the place where I come from. Um, we have an integrative oncology uh, program for uh, 12 years in Haifa, Northern Israel. And this is one of the, the motives to, um, I mean, our experience during the COVID-19 was one of the motive to approach Linda and the other uh, colleagues in, in our task force and I would briefly just introduce you the, the setting so you can see and understand better what where it, does it come from. So we are, we, our place is in, in, in Haifa in northern Israel and we, we, we work inside an, an, a, a public oncology service with 18 practitioners uh, one third of them are IPs, integrative physicians practicing herbal medicine, TCM, homeopathy, anthroposophic medicine, and so on. The second sector are dual practitioners, which uh, include nurses, uh, social worker, occupational therapists, dietitian, and so on. And the other sector are a therapist that comes from complementary medicine, all uh, undergoing 270 hours of training, spe specified training in integrative oncology and supportive cancer care. So the idea is that we serve the, the oncology service and actually every person that receives chemotherapy or palliative care can be referred by the oncologist, uh, social, uh, nurse oncologist, social worker and so on, and they receive weekly integrative treatment once a week or twice a week, as long as they receive chemotherapy and if they have advanced disease, there's no limit to that. So about 40% of our patients are from Haifa, but as you can see, many more are from the periphery and it means that there is a real gap between the, the motivation of patients to come and their ability, their accessibility to really come once a week or twice a week to Haifa. And this is why uh, our activity starts in primary care where cancer diagnosis is made sometime. And, and uh, we also work in, the, in, the, in primary care regarding home hospice, which is highly related to family medicine in our setting. And our hospital is called Carmel Medical Center. That's where the part of the diagnosis is made, the surgery is part of palliative care. A lot of people go to home hospice rather than, than go into end of life in the hospital. And we provide chemotherapy, and that's quite unique in, in, the, in the community, in two medical centers, and that's... Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, very unique, that it is not inside the hospital. There are two daycare centers providing chemo or biological treatment. So the idea basically is to generate a continuity of integrative care, going from primary care to secondary care, and then to tertiary care. So when we just uh, understood that there is a real, something is happening, you know, COVID-19 is, coming to Israel and then we, we decided not to shut down our service but to develop something that would be more approachable to, to patients. So let's look at this patient, a 71-year-old female 
She, she receives adjuvant chemotherapy for localized breast cancer. She was, uh, she was a nurse until uh, a few years ago, and she has a very good hand, I, I must say. And we taught her when she came to our medical center, we just taught her how to do self-acupuncture for peripheral, for taxan-induced peripheral neuropathy. And then we did a weekly session through WhatsApp video or Zoom or, or what is available, you know, Skype and so on. We did it and you can see actually that uh, our uh, integrative physician is guiding her at home how to basically do self-acupuncture here it's in stomach 36 or GB34. So this is something really manageable to do that. And when you, when you do self-acupuncture, you, you understand that, that self-acupressure is, is much more uh, uh, easier. As, so one of the advantages is that we do it, uh, it's not fee for service, it's part of research. That's why it's with no cost and we, assess quality of life outcomes uh, every six weeks. And this is uh, the, micro, uh, the micro questionnaire, the measure of self-concerns and well-being when patients just describe, you know, the, the two concerns they would like us to help them with. And, and then there is, this is a, the great question that we use to, to, to assess qualitatively uh, what, what really happened. What has been most important for you? So I would just uh, present the Michael of this patient after six weeks. That was uh, following three of the seven treatments that were online. And she said the online acupuncture was no different than when you did it at the medical center. You were with me and monitored me by phone. I felt it really helped me and gave me a lot of confidence that I had uh, an address for any problem. So uh, she really did it marvelously and we also monitored her when she came physically to our oncology center with a uh, von Frey uh, uh, with von Frey needles and, and, and we, we could see that her neuropathy got really better and better. And this is one study that was published. There is not a lot about, about uh, self-acupuncture or self-acupressure, but this is one of the studies that was published in Annals of Oncology, where a uh, molasoitis just described this for cancer-related fatigue. And it really encouraged us to do that. That's another patient, a young patient, 37 year old, and she's undergoing palliative care for metastatic colon cancer. And you can see here that we did mind-body together with self-acupressure. That's very important, you know, when they do mind-body uh, at the start of the online session, it, it brings them a sense of being more focused and then they can understand better how to locate the points and how to really be there uh, with them, let's say with a being gesture and not just doing, you know, pushing a button or something like that. So that's from her Maika, which I can't read here. Wow, wow, wow. But, but anyhow, she said that, that she, she's, she's talking about the guidance she, she got from the practitioner. And she said that she felt that her hands were not skilled enough. But you can see here that she actually describe a specific effect. I could feel sensation of heat in my hands, and that's something that can be related to the chi sensation. So it's quite nice to see that, that it really works not just like a, a non-specific effect as you would see here with, with this patient, but you can see specific effects as, as well. So this patient is, is, is receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy for localized breast cancer. And when you can see a little video, though it's in Hebrew, and, but, but Moshe Frankel can translate it to you because he knows English as well. Anyhow, just joking. 
את הרגל. You can see the idea. בצד החיצוני, כן? That the integrative physician just direct her through the... the zoom or the sky, <laughs> how to locate the specific acupressure point. And you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, 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 I can find it. And when you look at the MyCow assessment of 12 weeks, you see, you, you can see keywords that, that, that give a hint about the non-specific effects. You are harmonizing me, you give me confidence, but then when you look at the MyCow narrative, You can, you can find the, the more specific effects. It held for hot flashes. It had a sensation of tingling around the point. So it's not just tender love and care. It has specific effects as well. This is another a, a nurse, a nurse patient that came from Russia. She's very rationalistic and she works with her husband. That's the, the caregiver. And you can see here how the, she can locate the, the P6 point for nausea. And she can really, really say, yes, I can find it. Here is a large intestine score. And, and then she says, yes, yes, it hurts, it hurts. Yeah, I can find it. And this is another article published by, by Susanna Zick about self-acupressure. That's with patients undergoing survivorship, but it's again about cancer-related fatigue and about insomnia. So it really, really working. That's another example of a patient receiving palliative care for metastatic breast cancer. And she's receiving, I mean, we do uh, acupuncture, but when we added the battlefield acupuncture, you know, the five points protocol in the ear, It, it really helped a lot, much more than narcotics, I must say. And then we just told her how to locate the points in the ear. Okay. And she can really... What happened here? What happened here? What happened here? What happened here? Yes, yes, yes. What happened here? That it really hurts. There is a sensation of chi. She can really find it. Um, another aspect is that when we do online, You know, it, it's, we are becoming a little bit teachers, not just uh, therapists, you know, or practitioners. And that's something that, that most of us, I mean, we didn't think that this is what we will do in regular integrative oncology service, but we really have to develop this, these skills. And this is the mica of this patient, a 68-year-old female, and she said, I, I hope I'm a good student. I at least try to be and believe. And, and this is a kind of teacher-student relationship in a sense. Now, another point to consider is that when you do the online, you need to be tuned as a practitioner. I mean, you need to be there really with the patient if you want to induce and, and just see the setting where Galita or practitioner is working with this patient. Uh, um, and, and how she can practice oh, it, and how she can, she finds herself, she, she works through the clinic. It's not something that she's doing while she's driving or something like that. There is a diary and there is an appointment, a 30-minute appointment, and she's really there with the patient. And you can see the before and after. And, and when they do... A little bit of meditation, they go and do some acupressure here, the in tank to alleviate anxiety. And then Galit can, can send her a short video. We, we use a very, very short videos that we produce, about 30 seconds. This is a video of her son, who is a real actor. And then she can send it while she's doing the therapy, the online therapy, in order to clarify where exactly is the point. So it's not a huge one, but it's, uh, it's, it's really a short video. Now, last but not least, the caregiver. And we use a lot, and of course there is an ethical issue if you can involve the caregiver or not. 
it's highly useful. This is a patient with breast cancer, a male with breast cancer, and the, the woman is, is the caregiver here. And you can see that he's highly interested to involve his, his wife, his caregiver, and Galit is demonstrating the in tongue, and then they do it. And, they, and there is, of course, another effect, another maybe non-specific effect when you involve the caregiver in therapy. And here is where they both have an online mind-body uh, relaxation. So it's really feasible, and this is one of the drives why we, why we launched the task force. And let's go for the practical aspects now. And, but Linda, when you have shown the slides, we didn't see the slides. So something, Linda, please open your, your mic. We don't hear you. Sorry, yeah. there's just too many buttons this morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we didn't see the slides, the, the early slides. Oh, oh, now we see everything. Okay, my apologies for that. So again, this is our uh, members of our task force and um, I already went through our goals of our task force. So let me just turn this to a full slide. There we yeah. go. Yeah, Okay. Um, and so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of the practical aspects of what we've been doing over the past few months. Um, and so we really decided uh, one of the best ways to get a truly international perspective of what people were up to in terms of uh, moving things online was to develop an online survey that we could share with um, our SIO members, uh, as well as with people that we knew internationally that are involved in integrative oncology care. Um, and so we did develop a, an online survey. This was done in collaboration with our task force, as well as doing a brief literature review to kind of look at key uh, elements of offering online oncology care. Uh, we also had members of our executive uh, review it as well. Uh, and we were really kind of focused on four main topics. The first was really looking at the challenges you know, that we fa are faced in providing integrative oncology care to patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers. And we had one section that was really about general um, issues around things like ethics, legal issues, staffing, finances. It's a big issue in many parts of the world. And just how do we maintain continuity of care in an online environment? We also focused a lot on some of the communication issues of how do you start an interaction, how do you close an interaction, issues around such things as recording an interaction, uh, and then lastly, some of the technology issues, which, you know, I'm a perfect case study this morning of just, you know, how do you get people used to using a platform that they've never used before? What happens when people don't have access to certain devices? What happens when everyone in the household is, is online and we're having problems with connectivity? Um, and then we wanted to know what were some of the solutions, you know, these are people that were actively providing integrative oncology care online and we're coming across these challenges. And so how were they addressing them? What were their solutions? We then um, asked people to say, what were they offering before the COVID-19 pandemic? And then what had they moved online? And, you know, we're not presenting that data today, but it was quite apparent that many of the therapies that were being offered um, in person in clinics were not really transferable to the online environment or some institutions just weren't able to make that leap. Uh, and then lastly, um, looking at some of the specific therapies such as doing self acupuncture, self massage, meditation, mind body therapies, what were the specific challenges around offering some of these specific therapies and how were these uh, challenges addressed? We identified participants through our, our SIO membership, particularly looking at people that were seen as managers or were leading uh, integrative oncology centers around the world. Also our task force members uh, and uh, other kind of snowball sampling. We identified people internationally that were uh, in charge of these, these types of centers. So we emailed invitations to these individuals and we ended up with 54 uh, experts uh, from 19 countries that accepted the invitation and actually completed the survey. And here's just a little glimpse of, of where we had people's responses from. And, you know, it really kind of shows that integrative oncology has, you know, truly become an international, um, you know, way of, of providing uh, uh, oncology care. Uh, and it was great that we got this type of diversity uh, in our response. So, um, Aaron and I are now going to kind of 
um, bounce back and forth presenting 10 key recommendations that we have pulled from data that we've collected. Uh, Aaron, I was thinking maybe you can start with the first recommendation and then we can kind of move back and forth. And again, we welcome your conversation and discussion as we move through these recommendations. We're still, um, you know, finalizing these uh, and we're really hoping to kind of get some confirmation of them in the next couple of months and hopefully move this uh, to publication. So Erin, I'm just going to turn it over to you for the first one. I'm happy to continue to move the slides um, for us both. Okay, so, so the first recommendation is to, is to be aware to the resistance to telemedicine or to online consultation. We're, we're not just talking about telemedicine, you know, uh, prescribing a remedy, herb or something like that. As you as you have seen, we're talking really about treatment and there is resistance to that. And that could be in the level of the healthcare practitioner or the patient or the caregiver. And they, they are uh, skeptics uh, regarding feasibility, if there is any effectiveness to that. If, and we need to establish a trusting relationship and rapport in order to be able to do that. And that's something that is highly challenging, for example, if you do it in, during the first meeting with a patient, you need to have some rapport and relationship. And, and, and we need to designate an integrative oncology staff member to, to reassure patients and caregivers and to answer questions. But, but really, one of the obstacles that we have found is the skepticism of the therapist or practitioners themselves. You know, we can't do that. That's impossible to do that. And it is possible to do that, but we have to acknowledge that people are quite afraid or find themselves uh, hesitant to do that. So um, if you have, you know, a brief comment regarding this recommendation, please, only a brief comment, please, please share it with us. Okay, how can we see you? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Here. Okay. It will be great if you can share your videos and we can see who you are. For example, Pablo, I can see Pablo. <laughs> it makes me so happy. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> so a, a, a brief, uh, reflection about recommendation number one to identify you know, the barriers to telemedicine in the level of patients, caregivers, practitioners, and so on. It's all right. We, we can move to the second uh, to the second recommendation. All right. Linda, would you like to lead that? Sure. It's going to have to be doing some flipping here. Yeah. So um, our second one, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. So our second one is really around ethical and medical legal um, issues. Um, and kind of the key principles that came out, you know, obviously this is the same as if you're doing it in person, is to respect and ensure patients' privacy and their consent. And obviously there's some unique issues around privacy when you're providing care in an online environment. You know, we have to ensure, you know, like today we're recording, you know, this call. Are we recording calls? And if we are, how are we securing, um, you know, that data that, that's arising from that? Um, you know, we have to make sure that there could be selection bias in terms of who's an appropriate candidate for online treatment sessions. You know, I've done some research on clinical trial uh, accrual, and I know that there's biases. It's like, oh, that person's too old, or that person probably doesn't have the technology or the skills to use it. And I think we're finding that more and more, uh, you know, uh, individuals are getting online and are getting comfortable with that, but we may have some own biases that we need to address. Um, we also need to be aware, especially when we're, you know, supporting people in providing self-care, you know, things like self-massage or self-acupuncture, that there are some uh, risks to online treatment. And so we have to find a way of managing those risks. And so some of the specific suggestions that came out, you know, is, is number one, ensuring that, you know, the team as well as the patients and family members are aware that the ethics of online care really do not differ 
from providing face-to-face -face conventional treatment. You know, but it's always important though to probably discuss with your institutional legal team, you know, are there any unique concerns about offering this care online? Uh, and then obviously consulting with a telehealth expert to develop appropriate procedures uh, to make sure that you're using such things as a secure platform, that the data is being stored in an appropriate manner. Um, obviously having disclaimers, you know, that there are some unique risks, you know, patients may be providing these therapies themselves. So maybe Making sure that those are, there's those legal disclaimers just so that there's no issues going forward. You know, it's going to be really important when you're working, especially with larger teams, that you have a structured training process so that everyone is aware of how to start a consultation, how to end it, how to ensure the security of that call, how to do appropriate consenting process. And so that should be a standardized training process. Um, and then, you know, we often forget that patients are within their own environment. It might be a very busy environment with lots of people around them. How do we ensure the privacy of that patient in their own environment? So recommending that they find a quiet room, you know, where they can close the door, um, you know, put a sign up saying in session, having headphones and a microphone so that what they say and what they hear in return is being kept private. Um, and obviously, you know, I mentioned the online platforms you know we've had these issues of zoom bombing you want to make sure that there's that online privacy that there's a code to enter that there's a secure link so that you don't have people that don't belong showing up in these very intimate uh, interactions um, and and just again making sure that you're having that oversight of this process so that if any of these issues occur you're able to receive appropriate consultation so I'm going to just pause there. Uh, I'm really intrigued to see if people have confronted these issues in their own center, um, or are there strategies that you've implemented to address them? Hey, I'm Danielle Gentile, and I'm at Living Cancer Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina in the US. And I know that um, for some of the medical and legal issues, there were some guidelines that were relaxed or we could do more than we could normally do because of the COVID-19 situation. And now we're not sure what's going to happen when COVID-19 passes, if it does pass, um, because we've had some good successes of delivering modalities online and using telemedicine. Um, so I think it's going to be a developing issue of what happens legally with our governments and even within our states of what they're allowing for telemedicine. It's a great point. And I think I know that there's a lot of research teams around the world that are doing research on these new kind of models of care, the new ways of providing care, and maybe suggesting that this is innovation that our systems need to embrace particularly, you know, providing care at a distance for very vulnerable cancer patients, immunocompromised patients, patients living at a distance, this may be a way of, of lowering their risks. And so perhaps COVID-19 is going to push us towards greater innovation. So it will be intriguing to see if they shut things down again, or if they kind of keep that more open approach. Thank you. One more comment before we move on. I'll make a comment. Sure. Hi. Um, our, our healthcare system, I'm with St. Luke's Cancer Institute in Idaho, and they're still just working out the kinks on electronic visits with our physicians. So we're way further down the chain. But one thing we're trying to do is because we have a strength and conditioning program at two different like gym sites, and those don't even look like they're going to open. So mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out how to take our that program to a virtual platform. So we just thought we'd start with that and see if we could just build it, go through legal, go through all of the, the process. Then it'll probably take a year to even get that up and running, but that's our, right now our massage and acupuncture services are back in person, mm. um, but I don't know if that will get canceled again. So um, so we're just taking one one service line and try, just trying to figure out how to do it. And our our, our cancer center is very slow to um, engage in this process. So, 
that's just a little update from Idaho. <laughs> well, and, and these are issues that usually, as you said, take months to kind of sort through all the channels, whereas COVID-19 has been this very much yeah. a crisis rapid shift. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. who knows, maybe it will force some of these institutional processes to, yeah, to go up. faster. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just, for, uh, for time, we're gonna keep on moving forward. Okay, Aaron, number three. So technical barriers before and during online session, and there's a lot of that, yeah. It's, uh, so we need to assess available technological infrastructure, connectivity, technical barriers, and consider alternative non-online intervention, of course. Uh, we, we think that it's, it's important to assign a staff member to address these online related issues. So there would be a guy, a person in the team who can really work with patients or caregivers and give uh, instructions, guidance, something like that. So it could be written instructions. It could be resources, other resources available to patients or to prepare them to switch between platforms when Skype is not working. Let's do it through what's a video or through any, any other platform, some are more secure, of course. Uh, there is an idea, maybe, and that depends, you know, on what will COVID-19, the second and third waves, how they would look like. But maybe to provide or rent tablets with online apps to patients, so they wouldn't need to, to download it, the, the apps or to operate it in a way that maybe is it's, it's, it's a barrier to them. And there might be some restrictions that you wouldn't believe, but religious uh, restrictions regarding the use of online methods. And maybe we should involve in, this, in these cases religious leaders as well and work with them. Uh, and, 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 and of course, if it's possible to create an independent website you know you know there are all kinds of youtube channels to host videos and then it's much easier to patients to to look at that for the specific clips video clips and again it should be very very short clips not something too complicated and ideally something that you can use during the consultation so any comments with that yeah, Pablo. Uh, can I? Hi. Uh, Moshe. Moshe. Hi. Who, who do I love Hi. more, Moshe <laughs> or Pablo? <laughs> Moshe. Moshe is a no, teacher. No, Pablo. Pablo more. No. No, with Moshe I have problem. Oh, Ma Pablo, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Moshe. Well, uh, in this point, I'd like to share our experience. Uh, we had really a good opportunity in this case. We used to take care of patients with acute leukemias and, and stem cell transplantation. So uh, for the first time, I had the opportunity to follow the patients before and after the transplants. I had to go in, in person uh, to do the treatment twice a week is in the institution they allow me to go twice a week to treat patients during treat the, for instance the transplant but before and after uh, usually I didn't have a chance to 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 have a contact with them uh, mostly because the doctors didn't defer the idea we didn't have referrals before so uh, I have a chance to treat them also with something. This is in non-invasive electrode acupuncture, yeah. And I've been using this treatment for inpatients for 14 years. It's safe and it's effective. And I combine the treatment. Uh, this this clearly 
it's an invitation for creativity. So uh, instead of uh, waiting time uh, uh, in each point, I teach them how to do focused breathing, just uh, uh, mind-body practice of, of conscious breathing in each point. So it's we evoke the relaxation response in, in that way. And the other thing I'd like to share is that uh, even we could do, for instance, massage therapy, uh, patients are very receptive to, to receive the treatment, even in couples. For the first time, I work with a wife uh, and a husband, and they really enjoy doing things together. Also, Qigong, uh, adaptive Qigong practice for them. And at last, we had developed a YouTube channel and a website, as you mentioned. So uh, once I finished uh, the treatment, for instance, instead of medication, I gave her or him a meditation and it's just a link. So this week, please practice this meditation or this two couple of meditations and do some chicken exercise. So uh, in the, in my, when I have a chance to do this type of treatment, I really enjoy it. Uh, it's very, very, uh, I have a, var a variety of resources to give them. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, just to share what we are doing here. Yeah. Thanks. Moshe? Okay, my name is Moshe Frankel. I'm a director of uh, integrative oncology in Haifa, very close to Iran, uh, in a large medical center. And um, we try to do it uh, the simplest way we can do. Um, we try to um, uh, do it as a group type of interaction uh, to address as many as patients as we can, um, including their spouses. Um, we try to do it so the technicalities would not be an issue, would not be a major obstruction. And, uh, and the third thing is we try to address what they really want to hear about or the needs that they express as uh, something that came up from uh, uh, a written uh, type of a questionnaire that uh, we uh, gave to uh, a selected group of patients. And what we did is we basically did it into three formats. Uh, one format was a group of patients that actually had many questions about the utilization and the integration of complementary medicine in general in care. We try not to be specific into individual care, but just give some kind of a general background, like what type of resources, what type of books that they can utilize, that have uh, what kind of websites that they can utilize that actually have a, a good, a solid information that you, they can actually utilize. If they have the specific questions about uh, food, herbs, we try to address those questions in that kind of a group. And we had that group going on a few times to address different type of questions. Uh, the second uh, thing that came up was... Um, Gosh, just please let us keep the time because we want to okay. present just the other recommendations that we did, and I'll be very short and concise. Okay. Uh, the second thing was uh, something that people brought up, that they are interested in Qigong experience, to actually do a Qigong exercise group that we didn't have any limitation as far as the number of people that participate in it. And we encourage the spouses to participate as well. And the third thing was unique ideas that we tried to employ. This first one was cooking tips that we tried to uh, teach uh, uh, patients. It was a very successful one, and we are trying, we're probably going to do uh, a whole series on that issue. 
Um, and we try to do also teaching the mates. You know, we had the reflexologist that actually taught the partner of the patients how to utilize and reduce anxiety and stress, which was extremely uh, useful uh, during this uh, stressful time. Quite simple. And group is the things that we're trying to concentrate on. Thank you, Moshe. Linda, can you lead us to the fourth uh, recommendation? Yeah, and, and just for time, I'm going to combine uh, the next three, and then we can have okay. another little break, and then we can okay. finish to wrap it up. Um, so have I gone too far? Yes, I have. Yeah, so. Okay, so number four is just preparing the online settings. So really, um, it, it's kind of like what you would do if a patient was coming into the clinic, but you know, scheduling a session ahead of time, obviously, making sure it's really clear that there's an appointment with that uh, client, you know, making sure that you're working with that client to make sure that they have a quiet and safe setting to participate in, in the intervention um, and trying to make sure that there's minimal interruptions, which is a real struggle for a lot of places and a lot of people that are living in really tight quarters with a lot of family members. So trying to work with the families to make sure there's that quiet, safe space for them uh, to, to participate. Um, and obviously, if you're providing online care, making sure that you also have a quiet space to be offering that, that uh, care. Because if you're doing something like a mind body, but there's people in the clinic, you know, laughing, or there's noise in the background, or people coming and going, obviously it can be really distracting. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's this suggestion, which was really interesting about making sure that we create a medical um, environment or some type of a therapeutic environment for clients. And I think that's a struggle for a lot of us that are, you know, cobbling together home offices, you know, um, in the kitchen, you know, and so how can we create that environment so it feels a little bit more therapeutic. So perhaps putting on your white medical coat, um, you know, having your stethoscope around your, you know, your, your neck, so it feels a little bit more uh, clinical. Um, and then also making sure that it's patient centered so that, you know, you're not wearing a mask, you know, that you're actually are being able to make Make that eye, you know, to eye kind of contact, even if it's through um, a computer screen. You know, and then there were some recommendations around how do you actually begin that online session. Uh, and I think, again, this is pretty um, similar to what you do in a conventional setting, which is really trying to co-define with the patient what the expectations are and what are the goals of the treatment so that there's that clarity about what should be the end result of receiving uh, this care. Um, and also trying to make sure that you maintain that patient's attentiveness, even if you're in a remote setting. So I think that suggestion, um, you know, by, by both Aaron and others about keeping, you know, if you're going to have a video, making sure it's really short, making sure that there's that opportunity for feedback so that patient doesn't just feel like they're being talked to. Um, you know, and so some of the suggestions, I think we've gone over um, them before. Um, I thought a really nice idea is as you're trying to begin that session, you know, we do this at our SIO conferences, is have a meditative session, even just for a short period of time to ground that patient who might be coming from, you know, caring for their children at home, working online, and then they come into a room and they're supposed to be able to focus. So perhaps doing a mind-body therapy for a few moments just to kind of ground them and center them before that session starts. And then obviously when you get into that session, you have to be thinking about how do you have effective communication during it. You know, so making sure again that you're clear about the goals, you know, saying that these goals are the same as if you were attending a session within our clinic. Um, making sure that you're not just becoming really instrumental, you know, like this is where the, you know, the acupoint is and this is how you insert it. Making sure that you're telling the patient, you know, that we're here with you, we want you to be in the moment, making sure that this doesn't become something where they're really focused on whether I'm doing it right or wrong. Um, and also, you know, maybe an hour is not appropriate for all individuals. I think we all have Zoom fatigue now. And so making sure that maybe you just do 30 minute sessions, you know, 15 minute sessions versus doing a longer session, particularly if people have fatigue or if they're really struggling with internet connections and things like that. Um, you know, and so there's some great suggestions that came out of this in terms of let's not just focus on let's manage your pain today, but really like, how are you coping? 
what's going on in your life right now? How are you feeling emotionally? Um, you know, making sure there's that dialogue, making sure that again, they can know how to raise a hand or ask a question so that you can pause and address any issues that are coming up. Um, and sometimes I think we forget and we get kind of, um, uh, when you're online, you feel like you need to be talking all the time, is making sure that you're pausing and slowing down your communication for people that may be trying to follow along at home. Uh, and a great suggestion is letting um, patients record their sessions and download their sessions or you record it and send it to them, especially if you're showing them how to do self-care. Having those recorded sessions can be really helpful for them to return to or help them mirror on their own let's say a meditative session, following along uh, with what they had previously experienced. So I'm just gonna pause here. We've got about 10 minutes left. Just to see if any of those suggestions kind of resonate with you or do you have some additional strategies of how you begin and carry through uh, those interactions? Can just uh, comment that um, we didn't do any individualized one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, sessions. We did it more group sessions. And with group sessions, if it was considering um, a content type of a thing, we divided it into two sessions, into two parts. One is a half an hour, just limited. You can't do 45 minutes or an hour with a group. Just do it for 30 minutes and then open it for questions and answers. Okay. Um, that was, uh, and you do it for 45, 50 minutes the most. Now, I have to, small reservation about that is when you do a, an actual Qigong class, you actually can do it for one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's, uh, people do concentrate on the movements and, uh, uh, when you're talking about an activity type of a, a session, it's you can probably do it for up to one hour. So this is just a small tip. So you're doing, you know, the group exercises are obviously mirroring perhaps what happens in the clinic. But did, did you have any privacy issues in terms of having multiple patients attending kind of one session? Did you have to kind of give them any advice about maintaining privacy and confidentiality in that setting? Well, we let it. We left it with the patients to actually show their face, um, show their names, right. um, or not show it at all. But you know, and um, for the practitioner that actually is the teacher, of course, they would like to be uh, to see more of the patients, you know, and see how they interact and so forth. But some patients was too shy didn't want to share, uh, but they actually did the, the activities. So um, it's interesting because those that actually continue uh, as they go along with the process, they open their video after two or three sessions. So this is, if they stay on, on that Qigong class, it's afterwards they open the session. So this is something that uh, you have to let them be and go with their uh, way of doing things. And, uh, and we actually, with the Qigong, we don't uh, uh, record it, but with the other uh, sessions, we do record it and then we disseminate it to patients that are actually interested and they could not follow up or they could not come and the uh, patients uh, really appreciate that. That's great. Thank you, Moshi, for sharing that. I think that really kind of points out to how, again, this kind of new models being more creative, it may mean that we can reach more people that hadn't necessarily been able to attend before. Okay, Aaron, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And if again, if you wanna kind of go through seven, eight, and nine or something, that would be great. Okay, so, so one of the main concern is how to promote specific effects. When I'm talking about specific effects, it, it means that that's, for example, if you work with an acupressure point to alleviate nausea and patients describe less nausea, it means that it has some specific effects. The non-specific effects, 
is the you know the tender love and care the 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 the, the the idea that you called them, that you de didn't desert them during the COVID-19 and so on. But in order to induce specific effects, and that's a huge challenge in online, we can do all kinds of, 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 of things that, that promote specific effects. So, uh, for example, first of all, we need, as, as we have said, to select specific treatment which is based on effectiveness, safety, and ease, of course, like we do in an in, inpatient uh, setting. We, we can self-demonstrate, as you, as you have seen in the videos that I've just shown, the treatment plan, the general, and th then followed with specific details. And then we can suggest patients to focus on, on that gesture of being with themselves rather than doing. What, what I mean is that when you, for, for example, when you do acupressure or another, another technique, I mean, usually it's, it's really there is a, an instrumental gesture through the online. People want to know where exactly it is. But if they, are, if they can close their eyes with a little meditation, they can really find, you know, if we do acupressure, they can really find their chi. And in order to do that, you have to be with yourself. So it's not just, well, it's two centimeters or, or other you know, instruction. This, this is exactly the bone. This is exactly the muscle and so on. But you need to be there and search it for yourself. And you, you, you have seen that patients find it. But, but you, you need to, you know, to release this idea of pushing the button. And, and the short videos, as we have discussed, can, can help with that. Just to, to be in the area and then to find out where exactly it is to you today. So it's specific, it's patient-centered, and then it can induce really specific effects uh, for pain, for nausea, for hot flashes, for neuropathy, and so on. Now, the, the, other, the other recommendation in, regards the caregiver. So first of all, we, we suggest to ask the patients about their expectations of their caregivers, because the patients are the ones that, that give, you know, provide the permission, the ethical permission to do that. And, and uh, and when we work with the caregiver, it's not necessarily that the caregiver is the one that provides technical support, you know, like caregivers that, that drive the patients to the oncology center or just operate, operate the online facility. It's, it's a question about the willingness, the caregiver willingness to be active, not just for the patient, but for themselves. So uh, we need to, to clarify, and we can do it, you know, in each session, we can do it again and again, to clarify if the caregiver is considered an independent client who requires treatment as well as the patient. So the, the caregiver can provide technical assistance, for example, hold, hold the, the phone, the camera, or doing, you know, a kind of massage to the patient, uh, we can do online training sessions for the caregivers. Uh, we can invite them to participate, actively participate, as Moshe described in the group session they provide in Rambam Medical Center. And we can suggest that the caregiver would film the patient's self-care at home. So there would be like a mirroring or like a reflection outside and we, they can send it to us in order to analyze it or to understand better how to modify it towards the next session. Nine, nine is concluding the session. We are about to conclude our own session in a few minutes, but it's, it's very important. I mean, as, as we have, as, as we need to establish, you know, we're just opening a session, we need to, to be aware that there is a place, there is a time that we need to to, to uh, provide for the conclusion of the session. session. So we need to plan how to conclude the session, 
how to ensure a sense of containment and inspiration, how to schedule a follow-up session, and, and, and maybe check with patients about their concerns, how they felt during the online treatment, ask them for feedbacks, and again and again, establish eye contact. You know, we tend not to do that online because we talk to ourselves or to the camera or to the screen. So, but we need at this time when we conclude the session to have to, to establish this eye contact. So Linda with her perfect English would lead us to the recommendation, the last recommendation, the final cut, yeah. as Pink Floyd said. And I think this is, a, this is a great way to end it, is that this continues, that there has to be a, a continuity of care. You know, the suggestion, you don't want to have this patient receiving care online and then the rest of the care team not knowing what's going on. So, you know, if possible, appointing a case manager that's going to help facilitate these online sessions and coordinate them and making sure that we're communicating with the rest of the care team so that they're aware of what the patient is, is receiving uh, at home through online platforms, um, you know, and, and it's, you know, really about having that consultation process with the patient, with their, their caregivers of what their expectations are around the meetings, are their needs being met, like Moshi suggested, you know, actually doing those needs assessments, um, making sure that this is a kind of a co-plan, that we're working with the patients to understand what they can provide to themselves and what they can receive um, from the centers and what they can receive online. Um, and so it's all about having that feedback loop. And, you know, it's important to also make sure that there's access to um, information. So there's a suggestion was made about having the patient case manager communication always being available, maybe having an online portal where patients can keep track of their appointments, even keeping track of their outcomes, um, and, and making sure that as we move back into the online setting, that we're potentially scheduling our integrative oncology care at the same time as their conventionally oncology uh, treatment. Um, and I thought this was a great first suggestion too, is that maybe online programming needs to become a standard of care and it's being introduced to patients. You know, we've, we've spent all this time and energy developing these programs, these videos, these resources. Perhaps we need to be including them as part of our standard, a part of care and offering it as an option to patients um, particularly as we may be faced with second and third waves of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I know our discussions kind of happened in between and, and amongst ourselves. Um, I am going to leave our, our emails up in case any of you have more questions um, or would like to be more engaged in the task force. We will be hoping to, to have some type of a, a, an approval process or a review process of these recommendations as we finalize them for publication. Um, but I'm going to turn my screen off here. And I know that we're over time, but if there's any kind of final questions or comments, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain them. If you need to leave, we understand as well. What precautions we need to take while treating cancer patients with acupuncture in the hospital or clinic settings during the pandemic? Great question. I will leave that to the clinicians that are, are providing that type of care right now. We're talking about self-acupuncture, the risks of self-acupuncture? No. Uh, treating the cancer patients in the hospital or clinic settings. It is not online, but physically treating the patient. So what precautions one needs to take? I mean, the doctors need to take. Well, it's a big issue really a big issue of how you how you provide safety in the acupuncture setting that's that's uh, that's uh, that's something that maybe we would leave to to another webinar i would say because it's 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 a it's a huge topic you know yeah. But, yeah. but when we but when we go to the online there is another layer to this safety you don't yes, expect patients true. you know to needle themselves freely and that's yeah. why, why it's, it's so important to schedule an individual treatment with self-acupressure or self-acupuncture so 
everything would be monitored by the, the integrative oncology practitioner, you know, including uh, needling that could, could cause harm. Because, you know, it is considered quite safe, you know, to do acupuncture, but we are talking about, about oncology, and, and we need to be aware that there are considerable risks, and especially when you work, you know, in a clinical setting, when Absolutely. you allow yourself, let's say, to be quite invasive compared to, to private clinics, because you're in the hospital, you know, today we, we needle patients, we do acupuncture inside operation, it's intraoperative acupuncture, so, you, you know, we are quite invasive there. So, yes. so there is a need to be, to, to keep safety, and it's, it's really a big issue that I wouldn't be able to, to dive now into the depth of that, but it's important in the online aspect as well. Yes, Very online is definitely safer. I mean, it's absolutely safe because you don't get uh, come in contact with the patient as such. But otherwise, mm -hmm. in a hospital setting as you, or a clinic setting, it is a totally different issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I think Eleanor also raised a question, just was mentioning um, the electronic medical records like Epic. I do have software that allow video and telemedicine visits um, for people, even if they don't have a, a tablet or a computer, they can do so through their phones, uh, which I think is great. But she raises that, that tricky issue that billing is a real issue for telemedicine. And I think that's something that we look, when we look at internationally, it varies by country by country of how challenging it can be to bill, bill for those types of visits. And, you know, this is where it's going to be important to do research on the value of these types of visits, because I think we need to get that research uh, and the potential benefits of online care to our policymakers, decision makers that are creating these types of billing policies. So it, it definitely is a challenge and it's, it's something that we do need to acknowledge as we develop these recommendations. So we're about five, six minutes over. I, I just want to make room. Is there any other kind of final comments or, 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 or recommendations about our recommendations before we close? Just a, a, question, a general question. Uh, what about music therapy? You, you, you didn't mention music therapy as a, an intervention, and, and I think that it's feasible. Uh, and, but I, I don't know if you have experience or, or why, why it has been excluded. We definitely did not exclude um, music therapy. I was just, I'm just pulling up my, I don't want to have, I won't have time to be able to pull it all up, but our data suggested that music therapy is something that was being offered um, within the clinical settings and has been transferred to online in many settings. Um, and that's both as a group, uh, you know, music sessions, but also doing it one-on-one -on -one with individuals. So um, we just weren't able to kind of get into all the various therapies uh, that were offered online, but music therapy and even art therapy was definitely part of that, the expressive arts. So, yeah. And we, we hope that our, our paper will be more fulsome in terms of talking about the various therapies and some of the unique challenges and solutions for each type. Yeah. So just to kind I of- I have one more question. Oh, and ahead. in case of online acupuncture, I mean, uh, suggesting self-acupuncture to the patients, you know, by if they have the needles and if they're doing it, how, what precautions are being taken to dispose the needles so that it doesn't cause any infection mm -hmm. to others? I mean, in this pandemic situation. You know, we, we, you, 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 can, you can do all kinds of things. First of all, the patients that you treat online, they didn't abandon the oncology center. It means that they come, for example, if they have a chemotherapy of three week cycle, they, you would see them in three weeks. So one of the options is just to use, you know, uh, something uh, like a container that you can close it to shut it down and then to bring it with you to the oncology center. I mean, we, we have to think of all, all these details. You're, 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 yeah. 
yeah, yeah, it's it's very important ones. Yes, exactly. Oh, That's the reason oh, I just start uh, wanted to raise this section. And you. actually, you know, there is a need yeah. if you do it on large scale. There is a need to to develop these containers, you know, these unique containers with with yes. the small size containers that they, people just can bring to their homes and then bring them back, you know, to the oncology center. That's that that's maybe a more a more ideal solution than you know improvise from a, a kitchen glass or, or, or a box or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's an important issue raised though that, that as we do kind of those invasive therapies at home, we need to be creating a protocol around that to ensure the yes. safety of yes, patients exactly. and their family members and, and people around them. You know, it's I, what was going through my head is just thinking about central line care and how, you know, often we have, you know, people at home and they're learning how to take care of that central line you know, using mm -hmm. aseptic technique. And so, you know, a lot of those principles we're going to have to transfer over if we have people, you know, doing this type of care at home. But um, yes. excellent points. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so just to kind of wrap up, thanks everyone for joining us today. We know that everyone's quite busy um, working at home or, or moving back into the clinic. So we really appreciate your feedback and your participation. And we really hope that these recommendations, once they you know, move out into the larger community, will have application not just for integrative oncology, but for all forms of oncology. I think there's some great principles here. I think a lot of different um, clinical areas beyond oncology are moving their care online. So we really hope these recommendations are going to have value beyond you know, the Society for Integrative Oncology. So I'm just gonna close and I'll let Aaron wrap us up. Okay. Thank you all to, to, to participate in this uh, meeting and we will really appreciate your feedback and especially if you find this, this meeting as an encouraging <laughs> moment to do online uh, consultation and treatment in your, own, in your own center. So please share it with us, mail us, and thank you and, and have a good thank morning, you. It was an interesting morning session. evening, night where you are and stay well wherever you are <laughs> yeah thank you all right bye 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 thank you, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.